Hi folks. How are we all doing on this Wednesday evening? 21st temp 2020. Frame rate looks good. Look like it's okay. Audio levels look fine. Let me know if it's an issue. Um, just waiting for the status to update. I don't know why it's so slow on the feedback here. Yeah. Quick look. On here as well. That's a good idea. This is on live. <laughs> All right, the stream's up and running. That's good news, folks. I can see it there. I wish it would show me that in the local plugin status window here. I don't know why this is so behind what's actually happening. Anyhow, I'll just wait a little bit whilst folks arrive because I'm slightly early. Let me know what you've been up to this week, folks. Right, oh, at least it's showing I'm live now, thank goodness. So, um, let me get the uh, agenda up. Make this bigger. Hmm. 
Oh. No is the answer. It's funny, the time it says on my stats locally is three minutes in and if I go to the stream manager on Twitch itself it says five and a half minutes. I don't quite understand why that's different. I'm not sure how good these plugins are or whether it's even worth, you know, using the plugins. So this evening I'm going to be um, covering a few things. Let me just go through the agenda first. Um, let's just up the size of the uh, fonts, that might help a little bit. Take these up. It's the editor font up, but it doesn't take the um, markdown font up. Probably another preference somewhere. Um, so anyhow, um, I'll just read that out. It's probably easier. So I'm going to cover the community stuff and news first off. Um, we we'll go through the items in there. Um, I then deal with, um, we're doing the interfacing between ESP32 S2 and the ICE40. Uh, so we're carrying on really from where we were last week um, with Circuit Python and MIGEN part one. So I need to finish off where we were on part one last, last week and then we can move on to part two. I could also do some CAD if people are interested, but uh, let me know. Um, hi, Alex. Um, but that's that's kind of my plan at this point in time. So let's just do the newsy bits first. Let's get that covered. So um, I'll, Almeja on the forum, or Almeja, I guess it's Spanish. Um, did a really nice job on a black ice MX diagram. Um, can I copy this? No, hold on, let me get the URL for that. Ooh, it's a long one. I didn't expect it to be that long. So that's a really nice diagram he did. Um, so much appreciated. Uh, he's just getting back up to speed. He bought his product a while back. And he's just getting back into it. And one of the things he did, I think, was um, that diagram, among other things. Which is really nice. Um, he's been, I know he's working with the uh, Ice Studio. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of good. One thing I forgot to mention last week is um, I noticed that there is uh, a new. Um, Basically, an RTL for C sharp. Um, I have Jenny Mushkin, I think his name is. Uh, I just put the link in the in, in, in the chat. He um, 
he's obviously a C sharp player, and I know nothing about C sharp. I've never, I don't think I've. It's one of the programming languages that I've never ever written anything in. Uh, well, I understand it's a kind of cross between C plus plus and Java, but you know, I'm sure somebody's gonna punish me severely for that description. But anyway, I have no experience for it at all. But basically, it's a C sharp based RTL description or domain specific RTL description within C sharp, which looks very interesting. I, you know, hadn't thought of doing really a. I did perhaps think maybe doing a C plus plus one at some point, but um, it's a lot of work, and I don't have a huge amount of expertise in C plus plus. I'd love to do um, to do an abstraction, a kind of RTL abstraction, something maybe a bit more like Enmigen, but in Rust. That would be kind of killer for me. But I know taking on such a thing would be enormous amount of work, and I don't quite know. I've not looked at it in enough detail to know. Um, how well that will work. I mean, like in my gym, I'd probably go to try and manipulate the underlying C++ objects themselves, rather than just go the Verilog route. I mean, you can always do Verilog as well, but uh, yeah, I think it'd be fabulous to uh, try and do that with Rust, but I am neither good enough at Rust right now, neither do I have the time. Uh, and I'd have to think very carefully about how the model would be structured. Um, but it would certainly be a damn interesting project. Um, and I definitely want to do that in future. I don't know what people think about um, different abstractions. I mean, there's lots of different ones out there. You've got like a Haskell, one called Clash. Uh, you also got things like Chisel and stuff, which is, um, again, Scala based, like uh, Spinal HTML. There are lots of different things out there um, that are interesting. Normally written by people in their favorite languages, really. Um, is interesting. Had a good ongoing conversation as well with Laurie this week about uh, setting up the SPI. And we're going to talk a bit more about what that looks like later in terms of the comms between the um, ESPS2 and then MyGen on the ICE 40. Okay, so um, that's that one. The other thing is, um, I mean, let me know your thoughts. You, you guys probably know more about C Sharp than I do. So let me know what you think about that stuff. I'll be interested in your feedback. Um, the other thing is we've got Black Ice uh, back in stock. Did some a couple of small batches. Um, I don't know where we are. Hold on. Oh, crikey, we've nearly sold out that first batch again already. Uh, I have got some more stock to put on, which I'll probably put on a bit later this week. Um, but, uh, yes. VB having black eyes. MX is again, which is kind of cool. I know lots of people have been waiting for these. Uh, I've got a bunch of orders that I'm processing at the moment. I want to try and get though the initial lot of those out tomorrow with any luck. Um, and then I might do some more. I'll probably put some more stock in, as I say, a bit later this week. Because we're almost out again. And... Um, 
that will probably ship oh, maybe the end of the week if we're lucky, if not early next week. Get those out. Which is kind of cool. I've had Toby hassling me uh, in China saying, when you go order the boards, the factory's waiting, they're holding all your parts. I'm like, oh, hold on, man. I know, because I did tell him it was probably October, but I'm kind of running late now, having to make the changes on Alloy and also on, you know, potentially the Black Ice uh five although black ice five is going to come quite a bit later probably won't see the black ice until january i would report but i do want to get the alloys made i don't know um i'd like to get them made before christmas so that they can ship out that would be kind of good nice little target can't guarantee that's going to happen at this point uh, given where we are, but we will see. We will see. Um, make yourself known if you're on the chat, and I'll say hello back. Um, so what else have we got on the list? So yeah, Black Eyes boards are back in stock. So. Um, I don't know how many I've got probably another month maybe a month and a half's worth of stock I think come January I will be out of stock entirely and won't have any more of those that I can put together and finish off so that will be about the right time to switch over to the uh, Potentially to the Black Ice 5, if I can get that sorted. Uh, I'm not really doing any CAD updates unless there's something specific that anyone wants to see today. I was really just going to continue to focus on the software side of Alloy. Um, if there's anyone here that doesn't know what Alloy is, shout on the chat. I can do a quick overview if that's the case. Um, in the last stream, we were working on getting a very primitive communication going between the um, ESPS2 uh, microcontroller and the ICE40 UP 5K. And we were trying to use SPI. Um, so I developed some HDL in NMIGEN. Um, some logic in NMIGEN. Um, the simulation was going well, that was all doing what we expected. The bench tests would create the internal SPI signals and the SPI bus would receive that uh, and act appropriately. Where we were hitting the issue was um, when we tried to talk to it from the ESPS2, um, we weren't getting any of the responses that we expected. But what's more, we couldn't seem to um, actually see the signal either, which was just a tad odd. Um, so let's just return to that and I'll, I'll deal with some of the bugs. If we get time later, we'll then move on to um, the next stage of that, part two of what that's going to look like, um, which is a bit more of a, an integration of the spy stuff so that we can use it in a more sophisticated fashion. Um, I don't know if I'll have time to do the other bit, but we could start working on one of the simple stepper designs. Um, which I think would make a quite an interesting example. So uh, let's just switch then. I didn't see anything on the CAD front, so I'll assume that we're going to continue with what we've got here. So I wonder if I can do a capture.
I'll do a capture in a minute and we'll go into what the problem was last time round because uh, it's now working I've fixed the issue um, there was a couple of issues actually that caused the problem uh, the first one was um, let me open up where have I put the file Is that one okay uh, how is the um, how is the size looking by the way folks let me know if you can read this I can take it up a bit further if we need to you probably need to be full screen to read the, uh, the code here so let me just remind you what I'm showing you what, what you're looking at here um, this is the um, this is the board file so when you're in nmigen you need to have a board file that basically describes things like pinouts etc and how to program the board that you're actually to, talking to now you don't need to do that in nmigen you could just use simulation or whatever but if but if you're going to be running this stuff on an fpga board you need to have something that describes you know what the pinouts and things are that you're using um, connectors perhaps can be enumerated that kind of thing and also the basic methods that are used in order to get the um, FPGA bit file image onto onto the device itself so what we're looking at here is the um, um, the alloy board file effectively that resides in the nmigen underscore boards repository when, when you download nmigen there are, there are more than one piece to it um, and the boards part is actually separate believe it or not so um, we worked on this previously um, the change that I've made that or the problem that I had remember last week um, it was Friday actually wasn't it because we didn't I didn't stream on Wednesday it was Friday that was only uh, about four days ago but we were originally using the SPI flash resource then I had some issues with the way that this worked it did a bit more than I needed it to I wanted something a bit more low level because of the problems I was having so I created the SPI resource Sorry, we were using the SPI resource and I had some issues with it. So I then actually physically just created the individual pins as resources because I know how that works. And there's nothing hidden from me then. So the biggest issue that I had last time around, I mean, there were several issues, which is why I, I didn't crack it very easily. Of course, the next day, as soon as I looked at it, I worked it out. But um, the first one was that the Mozzie and the Miso lines were switched, i.e., the pins I was using for them were flipped around. Um, this isn't the first time I've done this. It won't be the last time I do it, and I'm sure many of us have had similar issues with this basically um, the ice 40 chips support external flash mode whereby they boot themselves effectively program themselves using the external flash or they can be programmed now obviously the difference is one is a you know master type interface and one is a kind of slave type interface and of course, that kind of MISO, MOSI, or serial in, serial out role flips depending on what mode you're in. So of course, I had had this set up as if it was loading from external flash, when actually it was being programmed by the ESPS2. Um, so even though the programming was the right way around, the way I'd mapped the pins internally here uh, was flipped. 
so that was one of the reasons we were seeing some activity on the um, analyzer but we weren't seeing all the things one we couldn't see the clock we saw a little bit of activity on the CS and we couldn't see anything on mozzie or miso oh sorry uh, on uh, mozzie we weren't interested in miso at this point in time because we're only going one way um, so that was one of the issues that got fixed. I think that's all I've changed in here, actually. Um, so that was the first issue. Now the other issue we've got is really how... Um, I mean, it's unfortunate that in the way that we're, we were exercising the SPI from the ESPS2 side is we were using, we'd written our little programming test and SPI test in CircuitPython. Um, one of the weird things with CircuitPython, I mean, obviously it's not fast, right? Um, it gets its speed from the C that runs underneath it. When you're calling into that, that's where the speed comes from. If you do anything at the Python level, it's actually relatively slow in many cases. Um, one of the decisions that um, the Circuit Python guys took early on is to use very fixed APIs for peripherals. And one of the things they baked in quite early was the way that they were going to do their SPI uh, communication. Now. When they did this, they didn't bake in hardware chip selects. Instead, they were basing their assumptions on A, there could be multiple devices connected to the spy bus. So they didn't want to bake in the CS pin per se because they wanted the Python side of things to be able to choose which CS pin is being enabled so that they could select different chips that are being spoken to with the SPI library. So at a kind of simple level it makes sense the way they've done it. However what that means is because you're not doing hardware chip select you are effectively bit banging you know the chip select signal. And if you're doing large, long transactions, that probably isn't going to make much difference to you. And if you're working at low speed, you know, low board rates for your SPI, that's probably not going to make much difference. However, if you're doing very fast, small transactions on SPI, for example, say you are, you know, writing to a register say we've written a bit of HDL that sits inside the i 40 and we're frequently updating the register values. I mean, a DAC's probably not a good example, but say you were doing a DAC, right? Now you want to be regularly updating the DAC output, so you'd be writing to that register, perhaps, if you've gone the register route. But what you, your transaction will be made of, you know, a lot of CS ons and CS offs with individual register data in them um, and this type of stuff gets really punished now our test that we were running last week is exactly this it was a very simple literally write a byte over SPI and actually if you look at what that translates to when you're operating in this manner using SPI from um, CircuitPython, you get somewhat unexpected uh, pattern. And I'll show you that in a bit. So um, that made it a bit more elusive when we actually went looking for it. Um, my fault, really. I just wasn't seeing what I expected. Actually, a lot of the information was there. I just wasn't looking closely enough at it. And I was making some assumptions about the signals that weren't actually um, correct. So I had a couple of layer, layers of problems. Um, anyhow, it is all solved now and it's operational. 
Um, I will co come back round to this so that you can see what that meant in terms of um, the signal, so that you can see it yourself. And for those that were here last week and can remember what it looks like, uh, it might explain itself a bit better. But let's just go back to the code. Um, so what I'm going to do now is do the same same sort of thing we were doing last time, but I've I've factored the code into a nice uh, basic uh, class, Python class, that I can lean upon in order to do what I need it to do. So the file I've got open here at the moment is the code.py, which resides on the circuit pi drive, which is the internal flash representation, uh, which is mounted on the computer. And as soon as I edit this and save it, it will literally run it. Um, so if I want to, for example, run a basic transaction over SPI to the FPGA. Now, in this case, what we did last week was what we expected was when we sent our, our byte over the SPI, we want uh, that to be received in the FPGA, FPGA data register at the end. The lower three bits of that data register, we also mapped to the LEDs. So basically we should see that changing. So if I do that now, so uh, if we take this, so, uh, Call it FPGA for want of a better term. So my import here is I'm importing the alloy library effectively, micro Python alloy. Uh, that's the other thing about this. I've got two different kinds of Python running here. I've got the Python that runs on the ESP S2, which is the micro Python or the circuit Python in this case. Then I have the Python that runs on my local laptop. Um, that is being used to actually generate the HDL module that's being installed. Um, so in this case, we have a file that's already been compiled from last week. I didn't have to change any of the HDL, any of the MMIGEN stuff, by the way. None of it needed change changing in order to get this fix working. So um, there's a file on the disk called logic.bin which represents the HDL, it's the image for the FPGA. So what we want to do is we want to load that in first. So we can then use our FPGA class and we're going to initialize this with some uh, pins. Now in this case, it makes a few assumptions. So I'm passing in the SDA pin, just happens to be the pin on the way that this is this peripheral is mapped. Um, that's actually going to be our clock pin um, that we use to actually clock the FPGA. I'm just choosing a pin that I'm not using for other things at the moment. We also have a pin which is called RST which resets the ICE 40 and then we have the NSS pin which is the effectively the chip select pin and the input on the ICE 40. The other board, the other board uh, pins are defaulted in this class. If I show you um, to Mozzie and MISO, I think, or Mozzie and Clock, yeah, here, we've got these defaulted, so I don't need to provide those. Okay, so I'm creating my new FPGA object, um, and I'm initializing it with some, some basic uh, I.O. signals or pins. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to program it and I'm also going to test to make sure that it returns a decent number of bytes because after programming it, it actually returns uh, um, the number of bytes that it has written. And I'm going to go with the defaults here. I mean, I can pass in parameters here that control things such as, um, let me just quickly show you. If I look at the program method of the FPGI, I could, could pass in a file name if I want, otherwise it will take the 
default name which I have which is logic.bim which is what we called the RTL image last time which is already on the disk uh, slash in this case is basically what's on the D drive i.e. the mounted flash uh, I have a default rate here of about 6 megaboard. that could be a number of different frequencies I'm not really wanting to go above that even though it works above that uh, my clock is only about 24 megahertz uh, and I'm not using a PLL normally I up the 24 megahertz to like 100 megahertz or something so that the internal clock is high enough to go up to much higher board rates on the SPI theoretically we can go up to about 40 um, I haven't taken it that high yet but anyhow so we're going to take those those defaults so what I'm saying here is program the FPGA um, and if the result is non-zero, i.e. the number of bytes programmed is non-zero, that normally means it's good. So what I'm then going to do after that is I want to um, let's do a sleep time. Sleep. This does a couple of things. It makes sure that we, after programming, there's a long enough delay for things to settle down. But also I need this in the loop anyhow because I'm going to change the value that I'm sending to the device. So uh, time sleep, let's say uh, 0 0.5, so half a second. And then I'm going to do the write, so pga.write. So this is basically asking it to do a uh, to write something over the SPI from the ESP32 S2 to the actual uh, FPGA itself, where the HDL is running uh, and looking to receive these bytes. Um, so what am I going to do? Let's do uh, right. so. If you remember I'm using the lower three bits for the three different LEDs on the um, uh, on the alloy board so I'm gonna write that's bit three that I'm literally making bit three high effectively here um, in truth the LEDs are active low but I invert the signal from the register before I drive the LEDs so it, it is representative so this is bit free which is uh, I think it's the red LED yeah and then I'm going to do this again and again once for each LED it's connected to the FPGA. So basically, what I want to do is write three byte, um, three different bytes in a round root. Each one of those bytes will only activate one of the LEDs. In this case, effectively, this is the uh, red LED, and in this case, it's the yellow or amber LED. And then in this case, uh, the result of that byte will activate the green LED. And then what I'll do is I'll put this in a while loop, actually, because I don't want it to finish, otherwise we won't see it actually happening. Uh, true. That's... Now, uh, if I save that, uh, I wonder, can I add something? Bear me a second. Just seeing if I can show you the serial 
information coming back because it's always useful. Let's have a look at the appearance. Might be able to up that to something a little larger. Oh, that's quite big. Crikey, oh my leaf. Let me see if I can um, pick that up. Wait a minute. Uh, I can't see it on there. Let's add another window. Hold on one sec, folks. Let me just capture this um, putty window because I'm using putty to talk to the serial port. Uh, there we go. Wow, it's massive. Too big. Hold on, I've gone too far on this front. Just make it manageable on 24 take it down to like 18 or something Why? Hmm. probably won't be able to see the whole port that easily okay let's just use that all right so now you can see the putty interface there um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this file. So at the moment I save the um, Python file, the Ally, or rather the ESP32S2 that's running the Circuit Python, will notice that the disk has changed because I made a save to it, and it will reload the Python automatically. And then you should see um, see that load. Um, I did have a problem with this um, board earlier, actually. Don't quite know what it's doing there. There we go. So it's now writing, as you can see from the um, comments there. Um, so it locked on the SPI. You need to lock the SPI when you use it on the in circuit Python, and then um, reset the FPGA, flushed it out, found the bit image, uh, and wrote that to the FPGA. So that should now be running. However, I don't yet see a result on the FPGA which is odd. So let me just switch to that. So this is the device under test. Um, the LEDs are down here. I'm wondering if I might have to restart this. Bear with me. I'm pretty sure the right HDL is on the drive. But as I say, I was having an issue with this earlier, so maybe. Hold on just a second. Let 
me um, see if I can add the terminal here. You can see that. Okay. I wonder if that's anything to do with it's on the other screen. Bear with me just one sec. Let me just try something and just check that I'm actually still connected to this drive. Oh, I know what I've forgotten. Silly me. Let me just um, I know what I've forgotten. What I forgot to do was start the clock. Um, so the, the other thing that is done um, in Circuit Python is I generate the clock for the logic analyzer. That's what this signal is up here. But I have to actually kick that off. Uh, here and I could actually put the frequency in here if I need to. But let me just show you that actually whilst I'm here. So this is the uh, the call here, and all that's doing is setting up a clock in cir Circuit Python. So I, I was kind of missing that, so we're probably not going to see a lot happening. So if we go back now, hopefully now that I've got that in. Now we should have a clock signal, that's right, it's saying there's a clock, that's good news. Right, let me just check my values here. Bit not one and two, start. Check my pins, STLs to board. Uh, sleep. And I just take the default frequency that should work. Okay, it's loaded it, but I'm not seeing a response yet. On the board. Ah, there you go. You can tell it's real, can't you? Why isn't that working? I haven't changed the logic file. I'll tell you what I do. Let me just restart it. We just bring putty up again, don't miss it. So you can see what's happened actually if you look at the um, board, it's now actually running it. Can you see the LEDs? Because the first thing it's done is loaded up the Python that's already on there which was what we just said.
And for some reason, my putty's forgotten all the settings. So let me just change this. Damn, that's annoying. Um, And I was having this earlier, for some reason I'm not seeing anything on the serial port, which is very odd. But it is working. So one of the things I could do quickly uh, is just change the settings on this. Let me reopen this. It's because I disconnected the D drive, which has seriously upset it. For some reason, it's not showing me that. Oh, let's do it the long way. Okay. Right, so what I want to do here is just change this so it's a bit faster. It's rather slow. So I'm going to reduce the delay between the different LEDs. And I'm going to save that. There we go, it's working, marvellous. I don't know why it's cutting out. I did have a few problems with this earlier that I weren't having before. Um, I'm not quite sure what's causing the issues in Circuit Python, but it's definitely something in Circuit Python. I do need to update my uh, version of Circuit Python because it's uh, an earlier beta than they're currently on now. But anyhow, so basically what we're doing there is we're um, sending over some spy data. We're programming effectively a register inside the FPGA from the ESP32 over SPI. And then our, that, that registers uh, contents or the bottom three bits of that is being displayed uh, in an inverted fashion on the LEDs. Um, we could obviously write a lot faster than every 0.1 seconds, but then it would probably just be a blur. The speed that this will go up to will really depend. But remember I said about the, um, when I spoke about the issues I had uh, last time around with the signal, these transfers are very inefficient because we're sending, sending a single byte plus the CS pin is being bit banged effectively. So um, when we're debugging, I mean, obviously we went through the simulation last time, then we went through the test bench that I wrote. But in order to make, make it easier for us to see what was going on inside when ESP32 was talking uh, to the uh, ICE40, the interconnect between ES ESP32, ESP S2 and the ICE40 is not broken out on the board. It's not on any of the pins because I don't want people messing with those pins, obviously, because they are internal signaling pins. So we can't easily get in there with a logic analyzer. So what we did was we added in some extra HDL in there that basically replicated the incoming SPI signals um, and actually output those on a few of the uh, FPGA output pins that are connected to this header here. And 
because Alloy is running in this uh, uh, kind of a test expansion board that I also built, that then breaks out into this mix mod here. And then I've got a mix mod extender that then connects to the breadboard uh, connector in this case. So I can use it later for doing the stepper stuff. But I'm tapping in on that signal. The test stroke extender mix mod enables me to do a kind of man in the middle uh, attack on the signals. So the signals I have here uh, go to the logic analyzer. So I can probably capture these signals and then I can show you um, some of the stuff that was going on with the um, with the spy transfers that was causing me to get confused last time around. So whilst that's running, I will uh, try and get back to here. Uh, I wonder if I can do a simple capture. Hopefully these are configured in the right way. Right, so this is kind of what I was seeing last time. Um, let me just zoom in a bit here. So what I thought was happening here was I thought I could see the CS changing. Um, SPI enable, that should be CS really, but I could see that changing and I could also see that signal on one of the other lines. And my assumption was because it was the MISO line, which wasn't connected to anything, it was just floating. Often what happens because it's running along the same cable next to it to the logic analyzer, it normally picks it up and inverts it and you see a like just a single glitch uh, on the other channel because it's not tied down to anything. And I assume what I was looking at was those two. Because at that point we didn't have uh, anything on the mozzie signal because the mozzie and MISO were around the wrong way. But actually it's a legitimate signal in there. Um, and if you zoom in here, you can actually start to get a look. So this is the CS pin here. And as you can see, that's actually um, that's actually very long. That's even longer than it was before. Crikey, why is it that long? I haven't changed the board rate. Anyhow, you'll get the point. So because we're bit banging the CS pin, it takes forever. It's incredibly slow if you're bit banging from Python. Um, so that's something that I might have to go in and have a look and fix. And I did. There was a Circuit Python audio streaming meeting on Monday, which I partook in. Um, and I'd also been talking to the guys in the Circuit Python Discord group about this and about how, because of the way that the Circuit Python spy is written, um, you it's it's very inefficient. That's why you have this terrible performance, and there's no need for it really. Um, it'd be quite easy from an API point of view to have this more optimized so that it does the CS actually at a C level, which would be much more reasonable. Um, you could do the CS in the SPI hardware itself, but given that their common library has to support all sorts of different um, microcontrollers, it might get tricky. And also choosing CS control uh, on SPI on hardware limits the pins that you can use to do CS because they tend to be very, in many microcontrollers are actually designated to only certain pins. Uh, and obviously in CircuitPython they want to keep that as flexible as possible, particularly if they have multiple um, different chip selects for different devices that are connected to the SPI. But um, it can be improved from where it is now on the Python side just by porting that part of it to C. So that when you actually construct the SPI uh, abstraction, the board abstraction, uh, from the common HAL in CircuitPython, you could pass in a new 
a new um, pin called CS pin. Um, which it doesn't currently support because it relies on you doing that manually bit banging it. So uh, I did say that I'd take a look at that with a view to seeing if that improves it. And if it does improve it, then maybe I'll do a pull request or something and we'll see if we can't get that into circuit Python. So again, if I go back to the logic analyzer here, you don't actually see what's going on until you really zoom in. It is incredibly wasteful. So there's the actual transaction. Can you see you've got your eight clock cycles from the SCK signal, the spy clock. Uh, here you've got the serial in signal or the MISO signal. And you can clearly see in this case, it's sending a, um, <laughs> sending two, zero two. Um, let's just scroll back out a little bit. You still can't see the edges here. So if you get in enough to actually see the entire CS, the entire SPI transaction, Can you see that's like 0 0.1 it's 125 milliseconds <laughs> my god it's just ginormous but the only bit of it that's serving any purpose in terms of transferring data is you know about in this case what's it saying it's only about a millisecond of that is actually data so it's one in one hundredth foremost. So not good. And that's why I couldn't see it before, because I just wasn't zooming in to see that signal. I just thought it was a glitch. So incredible, really. So if we scroll further, so that was what? Uh, that's O2. So the next one should be O1, shouldn't it? Frankly. Don't forget, I've got a hundred millisecond delay. Yeah. Oh, this is really, really rather slow. Let's scroll out, it's easier. So that's 04. Well, I've gone too far now. Because remember, I'm sending 04, 02, and then 01. That's 04. So this should be 02. Yeah, there you go. So part of the problem was really just very simply not being able to find, you know, uh, not the needle in the haystack so much, but the signal in the noise or the signal in the non-useful uh, parts of the logic signal or signaling. It's not actually noise. It's just um, space overhead. So that's one thing we need to get fixed. I thought I'd show you that because it's easy to do that. Uh, and again, this is useful being able to do this. So getting some visibility. I mean, my problem was, I thought, well, is this signal actually going into the FPGA? And I, I knew it should be because the FPGA gets programmed and it's, it's using the very same lines in, in order to, to do the SBI transfer. So I knew that the signals were there. So it was really just a case of um, working out what was happening to them. And you, you can do that quite easily in, in your HDL by taking the signals on the input and then literally just outputting them into the, uh, into the FPGA pins that are 
in, in this case on on the mix mod output um, and then tapping them with the logic analyzer so we can actually get to see the transactions happening and of course this looks so different from what we were looking at on the simulator on the simulator we were literally doing one transfer then another transfer and there's very little time in between it and the cs was really up close like a clock length either side uh, of the actual data signal as in a serial clock length not not the sampling clock length so that was what the problem was uh, you can get some insight into that you can easily fool yourself as i did there um and that's why i couldn't find it uh, of course not having the actual signal mozzie and miso around the right, right way doesn't help um but the combination of those two things meant there's no way it was going to work it wasn't easy to see what was going on but anyhow so that now actually works which is kind of cool uh, so I don't need that signal for the moment. Let's get rid of that. Uh, just to remind you, that's what we're seeing. Right, so that's the update from last week. I should also just remind you what we were seeing um, on the HDL side. Um, which was, this is basically the part that is running right now. Remember we had we had the simulation which we went through and then we had the um, this is the internal elaboration of the SPI we had the SPI LED bench which basically ran an exercise the SPI and my gen SPI HDL actually exercised it in situ inside the FPGA so in this case we're actually generating the SPI signal itself and we're passing that on to the FPGA module it's represented down here and then the final piece that we didn't get working last week that's now working is this piece so this is what gets run effectively um, when the ICE 40 is programmed with the binary file. Um, so just a quick reminder what we're doing here. So the the LED output here is these three signals. Remember from the um, the alloy uh, board representation inside the um, board file which is these LED resources so we're literally pulling those out in order to use them so what, what I'm doing is I'm using the um, the cat class here which basically concatenates a bunch of signals in this case three one-bit signals together to create a free three bit signal called LED um, I'm also grabbing the resources I need from the board file the platform here because uh, I need the SPI pins that are connected to the FPGA from the ESP32S2 uh, which is the MOSI, the SCK, CS and MISO. I'm not actually using the um, serial out in this case. I create a module, I create a sub-module which is an FPGA, okay, which is created when we actually create this class, an internal representation here of the FPGA class. Uh, remember the FPGA we're talking about here is an NMIGEN FPGA class, which is different from the circuit Python FPGA class that's in the alloy library. 
at some point we will connect those two. Um, so having done that, we then did some combinational logic, simple combinational logic uh, on the bench, um, which basically ties up the um, LEDs to the data output. Remember the FPGA has an internal representation register called data, which is an 8-bit data thing. What we're doing here is we're just interested in the we're using the slicing method to just pick off the lower three bits the least significant bits of that register structure and we're inverting them remember i said the leds were active low so that's what we're doing here so we're setting the leds according to that um i'm also outputting the um serial data here although we're not actually using that at this point um, the I'm also connecting out the incoming signals on my test bench not on my test bench but from the uh, ESP32 that I've created up here these are my input signals I'm connecting those up to the internal uh, signals in the FPGA elaborable class and then these ones at the bottom are part of my uh, test points so remember I created a test point so in the platform itself I create some pins uh, which I've defined up here as part of my mix mod so I've taken out four pins that are connected to the logic analyzer using the mix mod extender so I'm pulling those out and then I'm actually tying those to a structure called TP uh, and then I'm connecting three of those up one to the serial clock one to the chip select clock and one to the serial in clock so basically whatever comes in on those pins also gets output to the test points and those test points I'm hooking up on the mix mod extender Okay, so that's what we're doing. So it's a very simple uh, piece of code at this point that we're running. Very simple model that's been generated in MMIGEN. And all that it's doing is it's, it's basically taking the FPGA uh, class or model here and it's exercising that using the incoming signals from the ESP32 and it's outputting the lower three bits of the uh, final data register that gets written to by the SPI. So it's a very, very primitive um, piece of HDL, but what it does is it serves its purpose to show us that we can do basically an SPI transaction at a reasonable speed from the ESP32 S2 into the actual ICE 40. So when this HDL is actually installed in the ICE 40, uh, we can see that it's actually working. The next step really, so part two, um, is going to be about how we then take that and create something a bit more useful and flexible moving forward. Are there any questions? I'm just going to have a sip of my drink regarding that so far or are there any people here that maybe aren't up to date on some of the previous streams that just need some help knowing where we are i'll just give you a couple of minutes whilst i sip my tea to let me know if there's anything you need answering before i move on to part two hi laurie Laurie asks, uh, calling the class FPGA is very confusing. <laughs> yeah, which one? Which one? <laughs> you mean the MMIGEM one or both? <laughs> Isn't it just an SPI class? It is right now. Um, 
But what it will be will be um, it will be effectively the bus interface. It will be an abstraction that is the bus interface between the ESPS2 and the um, ICE40 for whatever HDL is running inside. Yeah, the N minus one. So I mean, really, if anything, it could be called could be called a bus, perhaps, or something like that. I'm open to ideas on what we call it. I mean, it's not going to be a bus in the sense of a wishbone or axi or anything as complex as that. I need to keep things very simple and I need to keep the latency down. So. Um, yeah. Um, I had a look at the stuff. Oh, you know, because I replied to your um, uh, DM on the forum, Laurie. Um, I had a look at um, <sighs> what you were using for your Z80 running on the ULX3 S. Which was based on Emard's Verilog spy interface. That had a relatively simple structure whereby um, the first byte was either 0 or 1, which was effectively a command. And then there were three subsequent bytes which represented the address and then as many data clocks, I think as were needed in order to, um, for example, write the information. Um, that information could have been written to, in fact, I wasn't sure whether that was just writing to the internal memory or an address bus inside the ULX3. I don't know if that was actually connected to anything external to the ULX3 or whether that was just the, like an internal data block or SRAM or, or something like that. Um, so, I mean, obviously I want to do something similar here. So when you, when you're writing things like the entire ROMs worth of code, uh, that interface is good, but it's not so good if you're writing small, uh, chunks, like if you want to write, read or write to a register. Um, can be Laurie saying uh, this can be several things. It can be it's usually the memory or of a sock, a system on a chip. So, in the case of what uh, I was talking to Laurie about on the forum was. Um, there was an, some sort of internal CPU that's been designed in HDL, Verilog or whatever that runs inside the FPGA. In this case, it was an ECP5 on the ULX S3 and could be running things like, it could be like a processor, like a retro gaming console or something. In, in Laurie's case, it was a Z80 um, retro processor. So in order to get that to run instructions, you have to pass in the program. So in this case, what the Verilog was doing was accepting that program over SPI. So basically, um, information could be read from the SPI. In fact, it could be read for the SD card, which is talked to via SPI by a, a microcontroller on the board that then sent it over SPI to the ICE, to, not to the ICE, to the ECP5 uh, in a serial fashion. That then loaded it internally into the memory and then the CPU could effectively be told to jump or reset start from a specific address where that data had been loaded into. Um, that's quite a common usage pattern so basically there is some storage in an FPGA 
and what you're using the bus interface for the, the kind of abstraction we're working on here is you can send that information from the microcontroller the usb32 in our case and write it into either registers inside the um, uh, FPGA HDL that's running or into its internal memory so it can then be read by something inside that's running inside. Uh, Laurie's saying the FPGA side can use it either for RAM uh, registers or the OSD, OSD's on-screen display overlay. Um, so in a lot of retro things, you need to choose which game you're running, for example. Uh, so you need some data for that menu, um, which so you could do an OSD overlay by having it write into specific registers or areas of memory. Um, equally, if we were to be, if we were, you know, using our ICE FPGA in this case to do to drive say a VGA display rather than having the microcontroller the ESP32 to do it we'd need to have to have a way of sending information to that display so the SP, SPI in this case would probably um, we'd write an SPI transaction of however many bytes a chunk of video space which then gets written into the internal memory of the FPGA probably a dual ported um, area of memory or something similar if, it, if we were building a display so we'd need to support similar sort of functionality different address ranges can be connected to different things exactly Laurie. I mean that's kind of what a bus is like although a bus is kind of more of a general abstraction uh, and I'm trying to avoid making anything too complicated that takes up too many resources in the ice 40. So uh, I think doing something very similar is what I was thinking um, where the wastage is on the scheme that was used in that case was that first byte that sent that command um, command byte we were only effectively using two enums in there which is zero and one representing either a read or a write the rest of the seven bits are being thrown away effectively so one of the things I was thinking you could do is you could have, you know, one of the bits represents the read or write of that particular um, uh, byte. So one bit represents read or write. The other bits could represent a whole um, seven bits worth of either registers or if it was zero, then it meant memory. So if the byte that you were writing, the first command byte was like one followed by a bunch of zeros, that meant that you expect free address bytes, which were then enable you to map the internal memory in the FPGA so that you could write to it or read from it. So for example, if you said zero and then another load of zeros as the first byte, so eight, eight zeros, and then the address that means you then get back you then read back all the memory locations from the start of that address bursting upwards for example in address space every time you clock a byte for it um, so that gives you read and write of the memory addresses but also by not using zero but by using some of those seven two to the seven bits that aren't zero none zero of those seven bits could be internal registers so you could effectively have um, 127 registers that are internal why would you want to do that well the reason that you want to do that is because the number of registers you have is likely to be rather small depending on the number of peripherals you built into the FPGA. Not like the memory address space where you need those kind of 24 bits or whatever to cover the entire space or 16 bits, depending on the size of the memory. 
So what you can do is you can actually just pre-allocate. Say you only have 127 registers um, that are effectively being mapped here. So when I want to write to one of those 127 registers, um, I format that first byte to be not zero, not what, not uh, half digit range, but my read and write bit I use normally, but the rest of the bits I use, as long as it's not zero, represent the register that I'm writing to. Then I only need to send however many bits that are appropriate for the width of the register. So, I mean, a register could be 32 bits long, if you like, but it could just be 8 bits. So in which case, when I'm writing to that register, all I have to do is send two bytes, which is much more efficient than having to send, um, for example, if I wanted to write eight bits into one register, you know, one byte into one register, that just takes two bytes on the SPI transfer instead of effectively four bytes which is what you need in order to write to memory. When you're writing to memory, you're normally writing in chunks. When you're writing to a register, you're normally writing much smaller amounts, depending on what the register size is, i.e. the register width. But if you take the worst case, and you're just writing to, say, an 8-bit register, then you'd only need two bytes to do that. Um, and that way, I use the other resources, the other parts of that first command byte, actually represent addresses of registers. So that's um, one possible way of doing it. I don't know what you think about that, sorry, but that was kind of what I was thinking uh, of doing beforehand. So you've got some uh, relatively small amounts of byte transfers in order to talk to the registers. Um, or you could do multiple writes or reads to the same register. So for example, you could to do a read from a register, you just send the, the uh, zero and then the register number, and then you'd actually just keep clocking in either a byte for a single value for the register, or you could just keep clocking it. So byte every time, rereading the register value. Yeah. So if it's something that you needed to keep looking at, you could do that quite easily. So I think a system like this would be perhaps a bit more flexible. What do you think, Laurie? Let me know. Um, but I'm just trying to think of ways of giving efficient, efficient usage. So with this mechanism, we'd have a way of both writing to uh, registers using relatively small transactions. We'd have the possibility of doing burst reads and writes to those registers, i.e. within the same CS transaction. And additionally, we have the capability of doing the same thing with memory, albeit with larger address space. Um, that would mean that a minimum uh, write, for example, would be one command byte uh, two or three address bytes, probably three address bytes. I can't remember how much memory is in there. Is it 60? In the ice 40, I think it's 127k. Is that kilobytes, 127 kilobytes? It's just over a megabit. Yeah, I did have a quick, sorry, uh, Laurie says, all sounds good. Uh, I would need to compare your scheme to EMARTS in more detail. But it doesn't differ that much, really. I'm just trying to use um, the commands. But, I mean, I don't know if he had other, imagined other usage for the uh, extra bit space, the extra 7-bit bit space. That he has in the command area. Um, but we'd basically be able to cover our bases with a relatively simple 
you know so this driver this base driver or library that could be incorporated into any of the HDL anyone was um, running um, would enable us to talk to the contents of the memory inside the ICE 40 you know the one megabit of memory uh, let's think carefully about how that was formatted but given that we can transfer by byte we've got good flexibility there even if it was like a dual ported um, VRAM type scenario um, plus we've got the low level quick register reads and writes as well so that would suffice for doing you know the simpler stuff um, configurations things like that I mean I don't know whether 127 registers would be enough but it might be an easy fit if you wanted to do something that was larger than that maybe you needed more registers you probably wouldn't you, you could probably take the, the nmigen HDL that we have and just modify it and create something a bit more um, sophisticated I mean if you were really brave you could actually create you know a bus something like the wishbone and have that operated over SPI um, but that's a fairly ambitious thing you know and it's not something that I'm interested in getting in at this point or you could have a more abstract smaller bus perhaps um, I mean, I don't know how that space filled out. I know, wasn't was it Charles that was working on the Murata SOC? Wasn't he working on doing a new kind of bus? I mean, not a wishbone or a axie, but some kind of more pertinent uh, design bus for his internal systems on a chip. Nori, do you know what happened about that? Did that happen? Is anything happening on that? Because again, we may see ourselves in a scenario where we could do something like that. Uh, in our case, it's slightly different because we're actually driving it from a microcontroller outside as well. BMB bus. Uh, Laurie Griffin says, Spinal HDL uses a BMB bus. Banana memory. What does he call it? Banana memory bus. What's the banana? Is that just like random? Because he couldn't think of a name, or does it have some significance? <laughs> banana memory. Not sure. Banana memory bus. What was it? How odd. Okay, um, so that's where we are. Um, so I was going to have a play around. We could maybe try and implement some of that. What are we doing time-wise? Yeah, we've got a bit of time. We can do that. Are, are people interested in me doing that on stream? Let me know your thoughts before I continue. Uh, is there anything I've not thought of here, Laurie? That would make sense or anyone else for that matter I know we're quite deep in the um, the weeds here you know we're doing HDL and circuit Python combinations it's um, fairly serious not going to be everyone's cup of tea but I'm sure people don't come down here for a just a casual conversation they're probably interested in the sort of stuff we're working on would be my guess it's now used for everything including peripherals okay Um, the only other thing that I should mention, Laurie, that might be relevant for anyone else is um, we may have a few li extra lines between the ESP32S2. So in addition to the lines that are used for SPI purposes, I know we're just using a kind of duplex 
one bit SPI at the moment, but that will move over to a quad SPI later to give us lower latencies and more throughput. Um, there's probably going to be maybe a couple of extra signals as well, possibly, which can be used for signaling um, all sorts of things. Like, for example, so if the FPGA wants to signal to the microcontroller uh, that an event's happened, for example, um, we can use pins to do things like that. But also, in the case, if you're doing events and things, you might want to know you might start using what's called like FIFOs. So maybe the FPGA, a camera example, right? Um, whereby you'd need some sort of handshaking. So maybe the ICE 40 is taking a camera signal, it's pre processing that way down, sampling it and doing some analysis and reducing the amount of data. It would need a way of telling the um, uh, the microcontroller that it's ready. And you need to be crossing all sorts of quite complicated clock domains. You probably want to use some kind of asynchronous, you know, FIFO or something similar. So you need some extra signaling um, to do that as well. I mean, we're not going to cover any of that today. That's 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 further down the line um, but you know you could use for example some of that seven bit address space not just for registers you could reserve maybe one or two of them for very specific event types um, and you'd need to deal with things like uh, when the FIFO is full I ready to accept information from maybe the microcontroller or when it's full and it needs emptying by the microcontroller. So there's some kind of base uh, signaling that would need to fit around the event scheme um, to do that kind of thing as well. Um, Laurie's saying EMAD scheme also has interrupts for the FPGA to the ESP32. So yeah, that's that's a, it's it's a similar sort of thing. In in that case, it's just allowing the um, FPGA to signal that it that it needs attention, it needs servicing or whatever. Um, but if we use a kind of a, an events model, we can make that a bit more sophisticated. So even though the you know, there could be an interrupt involved, a service interrupt involved on the ESP32 side. Um, what that interrupt meant could be queried by means of an event register, effectively. Um, so it knows what to do. So you can do more complex interactions. And likewise, there needs to be a signal the other way from the STM, sorry, from the ESP32 to the FPGA in certain circumstances. So you kind of need a, these bi-directional signals as well as some sort of event mechanism, some agreed protocol, if you like, um, for dealing with these events. OK, so um, I take your point on the naming. Uh, what do you think on the naming? Should we use bus, for example, or is that too, you know, is that incorrect? Yeah, bus would be even more confusing. <laughs> I could just call it spy, but um, what is the name of this? Yeah, let's, um, do I want to call it spy? I could call it spy slave. It's effectively what it is. I know we're going to do well. We've got a meta level above spy slave here. 
or we will have shortly. Um, now, I mean, it's relatively easy to rename this. Uh, let's go with spy. Load. Just check. check. I've now changed my references to those. So if I look at the, uh, we call it spy slave, and then I look at the um, usage here. Yeah, we've got some issues here. I probably want to rename this one as well. Okay, and then let me elaborate. I don't. I might need to do this as well. Yeah, look. Let's refactor this as well. Yeah. Another one. And this one. Ah, damn it. Not a speed slave, but we're using naughty words here. These are not politically correct. We may get into trouble. There may be complaints. <laughs> oh no. Hold on, hold on. What didn't we change? I know some projects have changed. Um, okay, so what do we use? Spy. Well, you have host and device, don't you? What do you think? Device? Maybe. I think device works. Server. Ooh, I don't know if it. Server doesn't sound right. Spy server. No, I think. I think device sounds better. But it's not really a device, it's a virtual device. That's the weird thing. I mean, it is a slave, but node, <laughs> but it's not a network, so that wouldn't work. Damn it, I hate naming stuff. You either get into trouble or get yourself confused. Um, 
What about spy bus? Or is that too confusing? What do you reckon, Laurie? Spy bus? <laughs> you don't like spy bus. <laughs> Spy server. It can't be server though, really. That paints the wrong picture, I think. I mean, definitely the ESP32 can be seen as host, right? But um, does that automatically make it a spy device then? Device is better. Let's use device, otherwise we'll be here forever. Uh, <laughs> damn it, I hate naming. We can always change it later, he said. <laughs> it's code! You can change it. Yeah, famous last words. Okay. Did I change it there, didn't I? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me change this to That looks better. <coughs> so let's, what do we do first? Let's try and implement the register. Um, we can then keep the spy led. Um, set up but make it multi-byte that might be a good place to start um, hmm. do i wrap what i have Can I wrap what I have, or do I have to fundamentally change the um, spy device here? The thing that's going to give us a problem is the CS. So at the moment, there is an assumption in the way that this works. It's very simple. What it does is yeah let's go through this because this will need to change now remember what i do is because these signals the spi signals are in a completely different clock domain i.e they're being generated by the esps2 not inside the fpga what i have to do is i have to synchronize the incoming signal on those i have to resample it at our whatever clock rate in this case it's 24 24 megahertz um and not only do I need to resynchronize it into our internal clock domain, 
but I also need to be able to see the current and the previous state of that capture. The reason I need the current and previous state of that capture is because I want to know where the edge of the serial clock is and what orientation that is, potentially. I'm only really interested in the positive edge um, because I'm in, that's the mode that I, of SPI that I'm operating in. Uh, I need to know that because obviously that's when I need to read the data. Um, the other thing is uh, I'm also looking at the CS pin at the moment and I'm detecting, I think I'm detecting both um, the negative edge which represents when CS is taken down low, that's when the transaction, SPI transaction begins and then the positive edge of the CS is when the CS is taken back high because it's an active low signal. That means that's the end of the transaction. I'm using those as well because I've gone through a very simple SPI um, model here. Yeah, so uh, what Laurie's saying is the example that he and I had been looking at earlier in the forum um, that Emart had designed had taken it or had taken uh, the inspiration from um, basically an SPI RAM interface. So, yeah. Um, I should imagine that has some base commands as well, some base registers. Or they may just be mapped into the entire memory map. Normally you can read like an ID of the chip and other bits and bobs. And sometimes if a one of those chips supports both, you know, one bit duplex and, you know, quad spy, for example, sometimes you need to do some things with the registers because um, you need to be able to tell it to be able to switch into a quad SPI I mode, for example. So quite often there are internal registers that you read and write to to configure it before you actually do any transfers, which he's obviously not implementing in terms of his relatively simple way of dumping memory in and out. Yeah. Um, so if we look at this very simple implementation that I did last week, or that we did, um, if we look at the combinatorial, oh, sorry, the synchronous parts, rather than combinatorial parts, what we're doing is we're looking particularly at edges. So if we take, for example, the... Um, reading of data in what we're saying that this this is part of the spy implementation the spy device if you like the receiver of information uh, so this chunk of synchronous activity um, first of all it only occurs when the um, chip select pin is zero. So it only occurs when we're in a transaction. Okay, first off, that's the first rule here. This is M. Mijin's weird way of doing an if using, um, I can't remember, are they, they're not, are they called context managers in Python? The way that this happens, I forget. Um, so that's the first if, if you like. The second if. Oh, and by the way, so what that's looking at here, the the SS, the internal SS uh, register here in MMIGEN and its HDL is, uh, as I said, it's it's got a history, so it's not just one bit, and it shifts the bits in to itself as it's going. It does that with all of these, so 
Let me show you that first so that you can see what's going on. So when it looks at the SS signal, that is the internal representation that holds um, two bits. Okay. So it holds the current state and the last state. And what it does is it shifts these. So when a new bit comes in or when a new when the clock resamples the SS line or sorry, the CS line, the incoming line, um, it gets a new sample which it puts in and it shifts the older sample uh, left effectively. OK. Oh, shifts it MSB one, MSB wood. <laughs> God. And concatenation in here is um, quite confusion. So that's a concatenation there, and it takes what was um, what was um, up to, but excluding the last bit, and then adds a new bit in from sampling of the CS line. So the bits shift two place each time, and it does that for the clock, and it does it for the serial in. So basically what that's doing is it's synchronizing all of those incoming signals to our internal clock, but it's also keeping to the current and the previous bit. It's a, it's a common HDL um, uh, pattern, if you like. Quite often, some people won't do it this way. They won't use like a two-bit register. They'll have two separate one-bit signals. One called like current and the other called old or something like that. Uh, I just prefer to do it this way. So um, when it's saying here is the chip select zero effectively, it's checking the MSB of that SS, i.e. Uh, the previous state, in fact, not the current state, the last sample. MSB. Uh, it then also does a check on the uh, serial clock in, which again is it's got two bits, and it checks for what's called PE here, which stands for positive edge. Now PE is a pattern of bits that's defined at the top here, which basically says, you know, it was zero, then it was one. So it's a positive edge as opposed to a negative edge where it's one and then zero so we have a way of differentiating between those two signals so what this basically does these these things at the top it says only when there is a transaction uh, in process i cs is low and there is a positive edge of the clock then we do a synchronous sample, a synchronized sample from the incoming chip select value. Um, uh, that's what we're doing here. Again, we see that shifting using uh, the cat for we'll concatenate here. So we're taking in the uh, basically the value that's been synchronized. Uh, for serial in and then we're concatenating it with the existing um, serial in shift register for the data um, I may get a few frame drops friends because I'm seeing some red on my transfer bear with me a sec just going to let it catch up. I wonder why it's done that. Hopefully it should have reconnected now. It seems to go back to normal. Every now and then you'll get a like a, a dive in there. You probably saw some buffering because of that, folks. I do apologize. I do hope I'm back. Laurie, tell me I'm back. Or anyone. Um... So what I'm doing here is um, shifting that into this shift register for the data. The data output is my um, final value of the byte that we're reading. 
Yeah. Um, uh, we don't need that. That's an old one. Where are we doing it the other way around? Okay. So that that's pretty good. That probably won't have to change. Okay. Oh, the other thing we're doing there is we're counting the bits in so that we know when we've got eight bits. But I'm not really using that at this point. But I did know that I would need to do that. So we have a bits register here at the top, which is used for um, counting the number of bits because we're going to have eight bits um, in this case in each each part of the transaction. So I have to increment that every time. So the other conditions here are uh, when our generic, i.e., when whenever the, there is a positive edge on the um, chip select i.e. after the transaction so it's when the chip select is going back up high remember it's active low um, what happens is we need to uh, reset um, some state variables for example or we need to register the value that's accumulated in the shift register for the incoming data so here what we do is we, uh, first of all, we set a ready flag, a one bit signal that is supported in this SPI. So anything looking or connecting into this SPI device can, can look at that signal to see when there is valid data. Um, so we set that to one, effectively. We're, we're saying, oh, we're done. We've received data. It's the end of the transaction. So let's set that to one. Uh, and this is a synchronous statement, by the way. So these happen at the same time, these two things. And the other thing we do is we, we empty, well, we don't empty, we copy the data effectively um, on the clock, the internal clock, into the data register, which is basically our output register for the SPI process, which we can then connect to for whatever wants to see that data. So that's the end of the transaction. Okay. Um, so the assumption with that is that we're only we're only going to output that data on the end of a transaction. And that may not be the case because what we might want to do is send out some of those bytes before that. I'll circle back around to that in a minute. We need to imagine the register case. So that's this is very CS dependent, and maybe we need to be looking at the number of bits instead because we ha may have multiple bytes instead of just one byte. Um, so we can either elongate the data, which in this case, the register is an 8-bit, or we can have several parts to the signature. Sorry, several parts to the signal, whereby we could say a byte is ready, but maybe the transaction hasn't completed. So if we were sending multiple eight bits or multiple bytes, but the transaction itself hasn't uh, ended. So in the example I made of having a register that we're gonna continually write bytes to, um, the transaction isn't gonna end until the transaction ends. There could be multiple bytes. So this doesn't account for that. So we need to add something that was more sophisticated than this is. You know, was an assumption that there's only going to be one byte, i.e. eight bits, and then it's done. Um, we, we, we could work differently to that. Now, the other one that we have here is, again, dealing with the internal state of the device. So what I'm saying here is on the negative edge, i.e. when the transaction begins, that's when CS goes goes down, 
um, we're doing some, we're changing some of the, if you like, the state variables, point of better term. They are registers, obviously, inside the HGL rather than variables. Um, so first of all, we're resetting the number of bits because we're starting a new, new byte. Okay. And then the other thing we're doing is we're making sure that the ready single is taken down low because it's active high. We're saying the data isn't valid because we're going into the transaction. You shouldn't be taking data from us at this point because it's not valid. It's, it's being accumulated or shifted in as we're doing that. So these two, oops, these two pieces, uh, will need to change because they're based on the assumption of send, sending a single byte right now. Whereas what we need to do is something a bit more sophisticated. So that's the first thing. Uh, I don't know if we're using any of that. I might get rid of this. I mean, what we could do, what would be a good test for this? Uh, just maybe using the LEDs, we could have a register for each LED brightness. Possibly. Um, so each LED could have a different brightness. That would go as three registers. For the test, that would enable us to then write to three different registers. That might make a simple bench. And in order to do it, so what, what would the transaction be there? So in that case, we could have each register could say be 8 bit for the brightness of the LED. We'd have three different registers and we could write to them all, read the values back. And if we were to then transact with them, the transaction would be effectively, uh, we'd send the register address byte so we're writing to it we need to have the right bit asserted then we'd have to have a non-zero value because we're not writing to memory it's not a memory write; it's a register write. so we'd have say the msb say the msb represented the read or write Okay. Uh, then the other seven bits, zero represents we're going to send some address bytes after this because we can do a memory transaction. But for a register transaction that is a write, what we'd expect to see is the address of the register, the number of the register, not the address. And that would start at one because remember we're reserving zero for memory addresses in that command byte. So our byte, our command byte would look like, you know, maybe one, six zeros and then one, meaning I want to write to register one. So the first byte will be one, six zeros, and then one. And then the next value could be the value that I want written to that register. So it would be two bytes. So the first command byte would be 
a write to this register command, register one in this case, and then the subsequent byte could be the value that we wrote to. So that's mode one. That's not burst, that's writing to an individual register. If we wanted to write to three registers in this case, so what we could do is we could then the second transaction, so that could be the transaction. The second transaction could be to write to the second LED value brightness register, which could be one, six zeros, and sorry, one, uh, five zeros, one, and zero. In other words, two, uh, register two, and then the value of the second register and then the third register could be one uh five zeros one one meaning the third register and then it's byte for that value so there could be three transactions so they're individually addressing the um registers or another way of doing it was because those registers are successive I, we're counting up, we're going from register one, two, three, as if we're in like a very basic address mode here. Rather than do that is the first register address is where we start. That's where the first byte following the command goes. If we were to send a subsequent byte, but not in the transaction, then that would go to the incremented register address, i.e. register 2, and then the third byte will go to register 3. That could work. So in that case, we'd be writing to the three different registers in the most efficient way, because we'd effectively only transfer over SBI four bytes. One command byte, which indicates that it's a write starting at register 1, and then three lots of clocking with three separate bytes, each byte value going to successive registers in the register address space, for want of a better term. What do you think, Nori? That could work. Should we do that? How are we doing for time? Damn it. I don't think we're going to have time to do all of this. So the kind of thing we'd be doing is we'd need our bit counting. We probably also need a byte counter because that effectively is our register offset so we probably have a let's call it a burst byte because this is like burst writing so up to the number of registers that we have. How many did I say that we'd have? 100 and it's seven bit, isn't it? The register address is seven bit. So the maximum we would go to would be seven, seven bits, potentially. Okay, so the PE symbol here, this, this signal would then represent, so it's end of transaction, not byte. And this represents start of 
transaction and first byte. So we probably want to be resetting the um, first byte here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Effectively. And then here we'd be incrementing now we have a no 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 what we need is if Hmm. So after every eight bits, uh, where, are, where are we incrementing the bits? We're doing it in the um, this here. So I think within this we'd have to account for the end of the bytes as well. Uh, we'd need <coughs> hmm. when we get the positive edge that's the only valid time where we could either increment or check whether it needs to be reset. <coughs> Um, so this is P. Ooh, so yeah, what we need to do is end this with, so we kind of want to do something like this. So when we get the positive edge of the clock and bits equal Oh, what am I saying? That's better. Yeah, I think we've got one more bracket than we need there. I do like these color brackets. So if bits is basically eight, it's not seven actually, but it starts at zero uh, on the positive edge, we do one thing. With M Elif P
So our previous case was I've changed that now. It only calls that if it doesn't get caught by the first case, which is not only when there's a positive edge, but when bits are already at one one one. Because what we need to do is reset uh, bits. I've only got a comma in there. I have, yes, good. So here we need to reset that to zero B zero zero zero. But every time we reset the bits to zero zero zero, we also need to increment our burst byte. I forgot the comma down there because it means we've come to the end of eight clocks, which means we're going on to the next byte. So we want to do burst byte. We make that equal to burst byte plus one. So our burst byte's now going to go up. I think Laurie's just correct, correcting my math here. He's saying 127 minus 1. Um, i.e. the maximum <coughs> of the byte. Bytes or register addresses. 7 bits. Basically, this will go around the clock, Laurie. I think it's incremented over that, but really we should reset it to the negative edge. But if we send more than 126, it will start writing to number one again. No, in fact, it will... What did it do? Yeah, it'll start writing to the first register again. We might, to ch might need to check for that. Okay, so let's just go and revisit this. Need to come back to the ready signal in a minute. Okay, so on each byte boundary where the byte represents data, it should probably strobe the ready signal, right? But that shouldn't be happening under here. We're probably going to need to have that happening. I mean, this won't hurt zeroing these here. That makes sense. But that needs to kind of happen every time we go into a new. new byte but not the first um i've got about five more minutes guys and then i'm gonna have to call off but we can kind of carry this on uh next time um and I can do some work on this in the interim as well. But what I'm thinking here is I need to be changing this value. 
at the end of each bite. Or is it this one? That doesn't happen there anymore. That has to happen effectively here. I think. I'm thinking that probably needs to happen here. And what we need out is um, not just data, but address as well. Uh, data. We should add in here. Register. So if it's the first byte, we'd be doing that. On the second byte, we'd be doing that. And we'd need to differentiate which byte number we're at. So we'd effectively need to split this up, this if section here. We kind of need a um, tertiary operator here. Laurie's saying register and burst byte are basically the same thing, but that's that's very true. But what I need to do here is determine, you know, the shifted in data we've got here is either a command slash register address, or it goes to data. So what we're doing here happens differently depending whether it's the first byte or subsequent bytes. So the exception here is you, what you kind of have, I guess, is this changes to an L if and then changes to an if and the extra condition here is and first byte equals zero So in this case, we're setting the register and not the data. In subsequent cases, we're just setting the data. So that's really the difference. It's just one line that's different here. 
So that can probably uh, be factored out. Yeah, no, I'm being stupid. Sorry. No, 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 you're right. I'm being daft. I don't need to do that. I need to record this. Ah, damn it, yeah, because what I'm actually doing is I'm not setting the register, I'm setting the burst byte. Ooh, a minute. Register equals search data. This is for the initial setting. Burst byte. No, Laurie. The thing is, burst byte isn't the same as register. Burst byte is the offset. Uh, so the register in this case would equal the initial data then in subsequent cases the register would equal damn whatever it was before plus first Right. So actually, I don't need to separate those two. Oh no, I do. Yeah, the register. I still need to differentiate. This is different. The very first operation. Everything else is the same. Do you concur, Laurie? So on the first time round, we're we're setting the base address, the start register address. Or to start register number if you like because that's what that's incoming then subsequently is whatever it was before plus the burst byte because burst byte is being incremented each time so for each subsequent byte we send um, we're incrementing the register that that's going to Yes, um, yeah, I see. I would set the register for the command byte and then increment the register. That That's right, but I need to know when, because the initial register value won't necessarily be zero, it could start anywhere, I do need to know that the burst is zero. I, it's the first time round, I'm differentiating it, because I'm switching on this here, in addition in this section which is why I'm then adding, then I'm incrementing the burst byte rather than the register. But, you're probably right. I probably don't need the burst byte. Yeah. not burst byte anyhow is it it's burst bytes that might make more sense but yeah I could just increment the self the register I mean if it's a processor core then the increment is probably a better command than an add mind you they probably take about the same uh, in terms of cycles when you're actually in logic is there an advantage to 
increment versus an addition of two similar sized things. I think incrementing by one can be implemented in less lookup tables than a 7 bit add. So it might be better to do that. Even though, given that we've got first bytes, it does seem a little bit illogical. It may actually be more efficient. So we're incrementing burst bytes in both cases. Yeah, there's a lot of common things in here that happen irrespective of both birth burst bytes. I'm sure I can factor some of this common action out. Right. Yeah. Okay, well listen, I've made a start. I'm kind of out of time now, I'm afraid. I'll do some more work on this. Um, then hopefully the next stage is we'll be able to then set more than one register with a value and do the kind of burst writing or maybe even reading after as well. Um, so thanks for joining us, folks. Much appreciated. Uh, I know your time is valuable, but I hope you find some of this interesting. A few have hung on to the very end, surprisingly. Um, so have a have a good week. Come see us down at the forum. Uh, let me just repeat where that is. Um, We can carry on conversations down there if you like. Um, I can give some update on this progress, etc. Um, I'll also record this and put it up for others as well. I'll make an announcement down there when that's done. So um, have a good week, everyone. And I will speak to you again next week if we don't speak on the forum in the meantime. So thanks for joining. Ciao.